Hi. Hi. Uh, today is December 9th, 2018. This is Brad Bailey. I'm here in New York City, New York, and I'm doing an interview with the Stonewall Oral History Project uh, with Ron Auerbacher uh, in San Diego, California. Nice to hear from you this morning. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Absolutely. Okay, great. Um, yeah, can you give me your name? Uh, Ron. Where where you, give me your name, uh, and you can spell it, and then where you're from. Where I grew up? Yes. Uh, Ron Auerbacher, A-U-E-R-B-A-C-H-E-R. I grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and lived there till I was 18. And can you tell me a bit about your childhood? Um, it was extremely traumatic on my father's side. Uh, my family had fled Nazi Germany, and um, I can now, looking back from what I know, understand that my father probably suffered from post-traumatic stress. He was subject to rages, or he was absent uh, about half the year traveling. Um, they, they, he, my aunt and uncle and grandparents never talked about Germany, um, but they were extremely German in um, temperament. And um, my brothers and I used to joke that if my father hadn't been Jewish, he would have been a Nazi. <laughs> and um, my mother suffered from obsessive compulsive disorder and anorexia and uh, also was prone to rages and uh, was in a, I think being very intelligent was a, in a difficult situation being a 50s housewife. She probably really didn't want to have children or be married. Um, and there was no uh, effective communication between the two of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I think the sense that many gay children have that there's something different about them and that they don't fit in, even though it may not be articulated, and particularly in the 50s when there was nothing externally to mirror what was going on internally, I was frequently uh, very anxious and depressed, and there was a lot of fighting between my parents, as I mentioned. So it was, I would call it a difficult childhood, and... Um, that, you know, I can remember being extremely depressed and not actually planning suicide, but thinking thoughts such as, I wish I were dead, even when I was in high school. And um, that culminated uh, that I went away to college. Um, uh, I was accepted to Yale because my great-grandfather was the oldest living graduate, and I was already very interested in theater, but I didn't understand that the theater program was a master's program. Mm -hmm. No one explained that to me. So when I got there uh, to New Haven, I was upset to learn that I was just supposed to take, you know, regular <laughs> college classes. Um, and um, I think... Uh, Somehow, uh, Giovanni's Room by James Baldwin fell into my hands. I don't know how. I think perhaps because I had read um, political social essays by James Baldwin in high school, and maybe I went to the library to look at what else he had written and discovered Giovanni's Room and um, became more upset and obsessed that there was something wrong with me um, be, you know, because I could recognize same-sex attraction. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, just some sense that, that, that I wasn't fulfilled just studying and memorizing and regurgitating information for tests the way I'd done in high school. Um, so I really had an emotional crisis and started... Um, wandering around New Haven and the university, which is Yale, is surrounded by a black ghetto mm -hmm. and without any regards to my safety or I just, um, 
and I would I remember sitting going out of the university, sitting in the public parks at night, and and also being obsessed with um, sort of the question of why is there poverty and why is there this poverty and there's this rich university and here's all this surrounded by poverty and the world doesn't make sense and what's what is my what's what's why is life unfair the way it is? And I wasn't I wasn't able to read or study or concentrate and and really started. This was just within a few weeks of arriving, and um, um, even though my family wasn't religious, they told me to go see a rabbi, and I did. And he suggested I see a psychiatrist, and I think she was worried that I was going to kill myself. So they hospitalized me in a, in a mental hospital, and but they didn't tell me. They put me in a police car, and um, they didn't tell me where I was going. And then I recognized once I got there that I was locked up, and I really panicked. And then the panic was a sign to them that there was something wrong with me, like prone to panic. And so they mm-hmm. gave me medications, which were, I guess, primitive in those days, and uh, I started writhing around on the floor. They didn't, they thought I was play acting. And um, so after four months there, then I was really just over-medicated and a zombie, and I didn't know what I could do with my life. And um, and then I was sent to another hospital. And, and then internally, including, you know, what's, the meaning of life, the the question of this same-sex attraction was haunting me. And in those days, that was a psychiatric diagnosis. So from the psychiatrist's point of view, there indeed was something wrong with me. Um, I mean, they were just doing their job, what they had been learned in school. And so I was sent to uh, the Berkshires in western Massachusetts to a private um small, uh, what they would have called an open hospital, um, which was called the Austin Riggs Center, still exists. Mm-hmm. And um, that, and I was there for two and a half years. Now, it didn't really resolve all the gay issues because that was still a psychiatric diagnosis, and um, I, was, I was terribly ashamed. Um, I could barely speak about it to to the doctors, but um, the um, the hospital had some brilliant uh, artists mm-hmm. because um, the famous psychologist Eric Erickson worked there, and his wife and the wife of the well-known playwright, uh, Bill Gibson, who wrote The Miracle Worker, lived in Stockbridge. And they were advocates for the arts as healing. And the hospital hired professional artists, whether sculptures, painters, uh, weavers, and a theater person. And I just had this chemistry with the theater director, and it was, so I I did indeed, you could say, end up going to theater school as I had wanted Uh to do under unusual circumstances, and I I became her assistant, you know, she, we would, assistant director, I would, I, I had a lot of leading roles, and it was just, that was wonderful for me, but at the same time, I was still very, very depressed, and because I believed there was something wrong with me. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I, that hospital was like my college, and I still have friendships that I maintain since then. Um, uh, And it led to my going to uh, NYU to the theater program, um, mm-hmm. which, which is now called Tisch School of the Arts. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, but so, but when I moved from 
this extremely supported communal collective um, interdependent small town Stockbridge Hospital to the enormity of New York City and the and a, and a theater program which was except for one professor pretty conventional um, and with a lot of emphasis on competition and how you're going to make a living and most people can't do it I again became extremely depressed and um, and and really didn't like that theater program uh, so uh, obvi obvi this was now about 1967, and there was mm -hmm. you know, the Vietnam War was heating up. There, were, you know, I was reading about acid. Um, California. I went to California for the summer, took my first acid trip, and I really recognized that there was a lot more creativity in the you could say hippie alternative uh anti war community than there was at this theater school and that I was really unhappy at that theater school. So I went back to New York and quit. I didn't know what I was gonna do, but I don't know if you know the East Village. I took a job at Gem Spa on uh eighth street and second avenue. Okay. Which was and I, I also went to Yale for full disclosure too. <laughs> okay. Way, um, well, I wasn't there very long. I was there less than three weeks. <laughs> well, I question though. Um, what um, can you give me your um, birth date and your current age? Oh, um, I'm uh, 72, uh, June 22nd to June 27th, 1946. All right. And so you entered Yale. Uh, which year? Which year did you enter Yale? 1964. 64. Okay. And so, um, obviously around that period of time in 1964, uh, did your, pa did your parents, you said when you, uh, when they wanted you, I guess, you know, when they called, was, tell me about the incident with the police. Was that more like a, like a forced committal on some point in 64 or what was that, what was going on there? Yeah. Well, yeah. Um, th as I said, I think I, what I believe is that the psychiatrist that I went to see was worried that I would commit suicide. Oh, and, in New Haven, got it. Got it. In, and and um, my father came from St. Louis, and he went in to see this woman, and, and I sat outside, and they talked about something. The door was closed, and then they came out, and I said, we're going to go downstairs. When we went downstairs, there was a police car, and they put me inside, my right. father didn't even come with me in the police car, and oh, off goodness. they drove me. And I was just, you know, and you know, as you know, these dark, yeah. dark four thirty is dark at four in the afternoon, cold yeah. fall. Oh, yeah. I and, well. Yeah. I and I was, well. yes. I, 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 then you know, so by the time I got in the hospital, you know, they drove me to this hospital, and I, I was really in a panic, and as I realized that I was. Indeed, locked up, and then I, I couldn't leave, even though and, I'd been in a wretched state for the three weeks prior. You know. And um, so, did you? And so, during that treatment, if you can remember, how much uh, of the fact that you were gay played into uh, their treatment plan for you, since it still was at that period of time considered um, a psychiatric issue? Well, I, I, you know, I can't know, but I think. I think there was a genuine, you know, that that was, you know, 50-50, 60-40, you know, 70-30, whatever, but it was certainly mm -hmm. an issue, absolutely an issue, but it was also an issue that of the recognition that this sort of Midwestern, middle-class, um, suburban um, environment, you know, didn't suit some aspect of my personality that wanted to learn about more a greater world, more life, more creativity, um, more experimentation. You know. Got it. And so, that's right. Perfect. And so, when because you I went to high school with people who still live in St. Louis and are very satisfied yeah. with, you know, and it, you know, so some just some there was some valid, you could say. Uh, psycho-spiritual crisis going on that wasn't only about 
being gay. And um and with regard to um so then all right so I guess we can fast forward so when you moved um when you came down to the Tisch School I guess in NYU what year what year was that? That was the fall of 1967, and I, so, I, okay. I, I stayed there two years, and when I quit was, you know, the fall of um, 69. So I was not at Stonewall because I was in California. <laughs> no, it's fine. <laughs> Experimenting. It's fine. <laughs> Um, I, but I remember reading. I remember reading in the alternative press about Stonewall. You know. So, what was your journey with regard to sexuality? Then you, you mentioned that you had some. You were cons- obviously you had questions about the larger world uh, during your time at Yale, and uh, and then obviously in New York City. So, right, let's go back to your period in New York City. I guess around 1967. What was your um, sort of thought processes about uh, sexuality at, during that period of time. And if you could... I just wanted to keep it as far away as possible. And In what way? Uh, well, um, well I, I had had sex once with another guy who I still am friends with in the mental mm-hmm. hospital in Stockbridge mm-hmm. at Austin Riggs. But I was so terrified after that and ashamed that I started to I I started to avoid him. Um, um, it was really too bad, you know, because mm-hmm. I could have had a nice friendship. And um, um, he's a very genuine human being. And mm-hmm. um, I mean, I still talk to him on the phone sometimes. And that was really a shame, but the the shame from the greater culture was so strong. And but then then when I went to New York, I guess fortunately, unfortunately, the school was like twelve hours a day. You just did, you know, circus and dance and gymnastics and acting and voice and rehearsals. And I had no time. I mean, for me to think about sexuality. And I can remember the one time another guy from the acting class invited me over to his uh, apartment. And I think it was the first time I smoked pot. So it was something like 1968. (laughs) And um, clearly I I recognized on some subverbal level that he was attracted to me and I just became terrified and left. Um, So I, I did nothing. I, I you know had no I just tried to make myself enjoy that theater school which by contrast with what I'd been doing in New England was obviously not enjoyable. Um, Got it. Except for one prof- one professor who was really into experimental theater and political theater and um and at that time, there was a lot of experimental and political theater in New York, and I would go to those performances instead of to, you know, conventional naturalistic play performances. Um, and um, but when I when I quit school, then I took a, uh, I just wanted to see something of, you know, what I thought life or something. I took a job at Gem Spa. And which mm-hmm. was half a block from Andy Warhol's Electric Circus, and I, I stayed up all night. I mean, the job was all night, you know, scooping ice cream and selling newspapers, mm-hmm. and and then I just see something I'd never seen before. And um, and I was walking through Tompkins Square Park, uh, and I saw this was now about October of '69. Mm-hmm. I saw a flyer about the Vencer Amos Brigade, which was a student brigade that had been organized by SDS. You know what that is? Right? Uh, if you could actually, for the record, oh, sort of student, student, the Students for a Democratic Society, which was probably the premier, one of the premier anti-war, anti-Vietnam War groups organizing against the Vietnam War. Got it. Uh, Tom Hayden had been instrumental. He later became a senator from California. Uh, with the state senate in California, mm-hmm. and um, uh, 
I saw a flyer about this brigade going to Cuba, and I just was fascinated. I thought, oh, maybe there is, you know, I didn't know much about Cuba. But I thought, maybe there is some country that works better than this one mm. with with less poverty and more equality. Because um, you could say I had a taste in that hospital of people working together cooperatively, some friendship. Um, you know, there was a sense of community in in that in in uh, in Austin Riggs in the hospital mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. in the Berkshires and um and I went there and um I saw I I knew I knew I I knew when I chose to ignore the repression and yeah. of the Cuban regime and the political prisoners but and focused instead on the economic development and the literacy and the health care. But uh, soon after I came back, we were there two months, um, uh, uh, an acquaintance I'd made called me up and said, uh, he, won, he, was, he was in SDS at Yale, actually, in New Haven, mm-hmm. and in Amherst, and he said he wanted to come to New York and visit me. Well, now I recognize he was attracted to me. And um, he, uh, so he came to New York and he said, you know, I read about this Gay Liberation Front. So we're maybe now March of 1970, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Maybe six, six months after Stonewall, six, seven, eight months. You know, soon mm-hmm. after we got back from Cuba. And could have been January, February, March, not sure. And, and he said, I read about this Gay Liberation Front, this meeting, let's, let's go. And this was like the worst thing I could imagine was that someone could read my thoughts about same-sex attraction. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, oh, come on, you're gay. I was just, I was terrified. But I went to the meeting with him. His name is Jason Serenus. He he lives um, near Seattle now. Um, mm-hmm. And he'll be he'll be at the reunion next summer. We're going to have a okay. reunion at the Gay Liberation Front. And, what, I mean, what, I, what day, when is that reunion next summer? Do you know when? Well, it'll be um, the Saturday before the Sunday parade. Um, Got it. Uh, do you want the date? I can get up then. Yes, please, yes, if you don't mind. Um, so the, the 50th anniversary parade of Stonewall will be um, on the 30th of June. 19, uh, 2019, and the reunion will be the day before on the 29th. Okay, got it. Um, and then there's going to be some panels and educational speaker events, I believe, that people are organizing. And um, so I went to this meeting with Jason, and I was just terrified, but I became it, – it was really a wonderful thing for me because for the first time in my life um, – um, I started to accept myself more because I was surrounded by people who were accepting of themselves or had been already uh, or had been, many of them had been involved in the new left either in journalism or anti-war activities or civil rights activities in the South or in in feminism or in now the National Organization of Women, but had been in the closet. And the basic message of GLF and the, I mean, one of the basic messages and the name of the newspaper was Come Out, Mm -hmm. which was a radical thing to do in that moment of history. And so we, we went to many, many, many demonstrations that were both gay-oriented and larger-oriented because it was always a multi-issue organization. We mm-hmm. went to New Haven to, uh, I think, because Bobby Seale of the Black Panthers had been in prison. Um, uh, we went to Philadelphia. Uh, there was organiza- There was a demonstration in the West Village where uh, there was a prison, a women's prison there called the Women's House of Detention. Mm-hmm. Um, 
there were demonstrations at NYU for the gay students. Um, um, and then we also, a group of us started, about 10 of us started living together on um, 17th Street near Avenue of the Americas, I believe. Mm -hmm. it might have been, we think, 17 West 17th Street. We, not quite sure, we think. And in a large loft uh, that was owned or rented by one of the members of GLF. And um, so we all lived together, and what we called it a collective, <laughs> sort of this communist lingo. <laughs> and, um, and we also um, engaged in what we called consciousness raising groups, which came from the women's movement, where try to understand how we'd been conditioned, both as men or as repressed gay men. Mm -hmm. or, um, um, and we held dances at what was called Alternate University um, on 6th Avenue and 14th Street, which was uh, a space where there was a lot of um, leftist, what we now call progressive classes, um, education. Um, so it was meant to be an alternative to the mafia-run bars. Mm -hmm. And then the money was used to support the newspaper that we were publishing. Um, and there I met, you know, really you could say my first boyfriend, That was really great for me because we were really in love and and, and did all these political activities together. Um, and what year again was this around? This was 1970, 1971. And by the spring or early winter of 1972, GLF had started to disintegrate uh, GLF means Gay Liberation Front, um, yeah. because um, there was always, even going back to the beginnings, there was always an argument of with some activists that, uh, well, two things, that we were spreading ourselves too thin, um, and so there were those who wanted a single issue that is an uh, organization that would just focus on gay issues because there was no legal protections of any kind. And, and the chaotic nature of the GLF meetings, because there was no uh, leadership or organization by design, and the organization that became GAA, the Gay Activist Alliance, split on those two issues. So they were just a single issue, you could say, gay. They were very effective. And, you know, there's arguments to be made on both sides. But mm -hmm. they didn't want to be going to Black Panther demonstrations or women's demonstrations or civil rights demonstrations. Why? Why? Because they yeah. thought there was so much work to be done, you know, say, about job discrimination or housing mm -hmm. discrimination uh, or police corruption or, or the mafia-run bars or, uh, you, you know, because Got there was, it. you know, say, how do you, how do you inter interact with the, just the city council of New York or the Got mayor it. or – and. I mean, you know, they're bo both sides are valid, but I would say the people in GLF who had this multi-issue background, who had already been involved with organizing either in the South with the Black Civil Rights Movement or against the Vietnam War, and this was the height of the Vietnam War, so people were, I mean, in Vietnam, you know, civilians were being slaughtered as well as American soldiers, and... I mean, from my point of view and those like me, we couldn't see just putting blinders on to everything else that was going on in the greater world and it, and that it was all inter interrelated, the same kind of 
society that would have such uh, shallow regard for human life, whether it's in the U.S. or overseas, is the same mindset that would say, well, because your sexual attraction is different or your gender expression is different, um, you're less than. Mm-hmm. I mean, and I still I still agree with that, but I can really understand the point of view of, of the Gay Activist Alliance because our meetings were indeed very chaotic. <laughs> you know, the, the Gay Activist Alliance wanted to have Robert's Rules of Order. They wanted to have more leadership, um, more accountability, more focus on particular issues like, say, housing or job discrimination that that they would agree on and that they're going to work on those issues. And, and, and they were effective indeed. Um, I mean, and for, ex- uh, for example, within a few years, uh, the American Psychiatric Association had uh, eliminated the uh, same-sex attraction as a psychiatric diagnosis, you know, in their manual one. But so the GLF, Gay Liberation Front, started to disintegrate by the winter of 1972. And and we had heard how beautiful California was. I mean, I already been there once for a couple of months, as I mentioned. Mm-hmm. So many, many of us, you know, just kind of got in cars relatively within a few months' time and moved to Berkeley or San Francisco. But uh, I kept up some of the friendships um, uh, particularly with Jason, who had invited Jason Serenos, who had invited me to my first meeting. Mm-hmm. Um, we ended up living in San Francisco in a in a because we were both very interested in learning holistic health. So we ended up in a school, uh, living in a large mansion in San Francisco that was a school for um, body work. Uh, called postural integration, which was a spinoff mm-hmm. of Rolfing, which is deep deep tissue body work with a psychological component. Um, mm-hmm. um, I'm listening. And so, what okay. did you? Um, and so, with, when it came down to the sort of separation, what do you think uh, the result of that? What did you think left in sort of the aftermath? of those two groups sort of disintegrating like that? Did it leave a void? Well, no, the one GLF, GLF, Gay Liberation Front, disintegrated, but the Gay Activist Alliance was very, very strong. So there was clearly at that time, in in terms of attracting membership, you could say a, a general agreement among people who are attracted to be part of an organization that what they wanted to do in the early 70s was be in a single issue that is gay, what would now be called LGBT organization that focused solely on advocating for those issues. And yes, the war was going on, or yes, there was, you know, discrimination against women or black, but that, you know, G- Gay Activist Alliance was not going to split up their time going to those kind of events. So what, um, and so in terms of um, the sort of uh, the uh, Stonewall, how do you think Stonewall sort of related to the sort of either success or failure of both of those groups? You mean the the street rebellion? Yes. Well, within, as I understand it, within days, and you could ask people like Martha Shelley John O'Brien or Jim Fratt or some of these people who were living in New York and were or were not at Stonewall itself, but they were at the initial formation of the Gay Liberation Front within Mm -hmm. weeks, I believe, um, uh, of, you know, people who already had been politically active that Street rebellion kind of coalesced something that hadn't happened before. I think you could say because the consciousness that had come from years and years of the Black Civil Rights Movement, you know, Dr. King, 
of mm-hmm. the National Organization of Women, of the feminists, of the yippies and the hippies, and people like Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin, um, the drugs, the anti-Vietnam War movement, the Students for Democratic Society. It was probably inevitable. I mean, obviously, some you know some of those people were gay. I use, I guess, the word in the way we used it at the time, um, mm-hmm. L- LGBT, and um, and so there was a, a recognition that they no longer wanted to be in the closet in leftist organizations or progressive organizations or whatever you want to call it. Um, call right. it the new left at that time. And so with uh with so after those um so with so which um so after um uh, so again after you I you did you move out when you came out to California did you continue that level of activism or did you um, No, I really before? became I really beca- and this was very interesting because if I don't, I don't know if you you know you remember in 1968 there had been this huge police riot in Chicago at the Democratic Convention. Yeah. And um, and seven or nine members were put on trial, um, ranging from a, you know priests to hardcore activists to hippies and yippies, and one of them was Rennie Davis, and uh, he had been in the in the in, I think in Students for Democratic Society. And mm-hmm. he announced in Berkeley that he was going to give this speech. This so this was probably summer fall of 1972, perhaps. I could go mm-hmm. look it up. But and the room was packed. It was at UC Berkeley mm-hmm. because he was he was an extremely well known political activist, and he had been in this trial. Uh, you know, in Chicago for whatever they were said, you know, they blamed the protesters for the police attacks. And um, and basically what he said is that he had become interested in meditation and the recognition that until he changed himself, the world wasn't going to change because we would all bring the same habits of mind of anger, jealousy, fear, competition to whatever political organization one was in. And that resonated with me. And I remember people just screaming at him at this meeting as though he were a traitor to the new left. But it resonated. Mm. It re- the truth of that resonated with me. I definitely believe that. I don't think it's an either or, but my it did seem to coincide with the shift in me of recognizing that for all GLF or GAA did accomplish, which was considerable, you know, leading up to the first parade and just the recognition of coming out as a political mm-hmm. act, that. I was still, as a human being, the same person, and so I started going to yoga. You know, the same person with the, with uh, you know fear, competition, anxiety, jealousy, and these hum- the, you know that all human beings have to, if they choose to, um, manage, uh, deal with. You know how because all these things will impact our personal relationships and the, the way we interact with others in political organizations. So um, that really resonated with me, and I started going to yoga classes, studying Tai Chi, studying nutrition, you know, health, healthy, more healthy ways of eating, how to take care of myself, because um, I could recognize that. You know the the quote unquote science of psychiatry or psychology wasn't as effective as it could be to dealing with the human mind, and also um, Ram Dass, who had been uh, Richard Alpert, um, 
uh, a colleague of Timothy Leary at Yale at, at Harvard. They had been kicked out for the LSD experimentation. Mm -hmm. uh, went went to India, changed his name to Ram Das, and wrote a book called "Be Here Now," and the only dance there is, which were talks he gave in Meningers. So they were very articulate, and I, so I remember reading this book. Very articulate talks about the benefits of meditation and how that interacted with what psychology was hoping to achieve for individuals. Anyway, these things really resonated with me and put into my mind a kind of mindset that if I really wanted a different kind of world, it wasn't going to be only through political activism. And I still was volunteering at a daycare center, you know, in San Francisco. Um, mm -hmm. But that eventually led me to um, go to India, actually, for five years and study yoga meditation. Um, wow. Um, uh, and I'm still, uh, now I've in, in San Diego, I've been a member and a student at the with some teaching responsibilities at the Zen Center of San Diego. And I also became very interested in a system taught worldwide called nonviolent communication developed by a psychologist, Marshall Rosenberg. Mm -hmm. It's taught all over the world. It's called nonviolent communication. And now I'm teaching classes in that at the Unitarian Church in uh, San Diego. Um, because I believe these things, these kind of tools help people to be as we change ourselves, we become more effective political activists. Mm -hmm. And instead of, you know, you could say, you know, really recognizing our interdependence and our humanness and our sameness in spite of what we may look like on the surface, which after all is the message of GLF, that just because one might have same-sex attraction attraction doesn't mean or or some people are more masculine or some people are more feminine you know that uh, inherently uh -huh. we still have to <laughs> learn to live together and create uh you know if we're going to particularly now if we're going to really save the planet you know yes <laughs> um from from you know from human beings from human beings destroying themselves and the natural world. Uh, so how can we do that effectively without having tools to manage our anger, fear, jealousy, isolation, identification of me against you? Uh, you know, at least that, that's how I see the world now. And so in terms of your beliefs, uh, you know, about Stonewall and about sort of that early period, how do you think that affects or have, has affected gay rights today or the state of um, being gay in America today? Well, I think it was enormous because there are two photos of early GLF meetings, and you see about 30 people in the church in West Village. No one could have even imagined that 11 months later, in June of 1970, you would have thousands of people marching from the village to Central Park, mm -hmm. not to mention, you know, within, I don't know, five years, you would have hundreds of thousands of, or a million people or openly gay people running for political office, obviously Harvey Milk being the most famous um, no one could have imagined. I mean, I certainly didn't. Maybe some people did, but I didn't. I was just going to the meetings because I knew I had to do it mm -hmm. for my own sanity. And, but I, I certainly, I think, and but that definitely somehow came from the fact that GLF was organized either within days or weeks of 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 the of the street rebellions. 
So, so you think so? In looking at, at the sort of history and future of the situation today, do you think we've come very far or benefited? Where do you think we are today? From what you've seen in your life? Oh, it, I think there's obviously an enormous change. You know, another thing I do in San Diego is for 25 years I've volunteered at a inner city school. Or, I don't know what the politically correct term is, but you know, an impoverished school mm. in in San Diego where it's um, like almost 100% uh, Mexican or Mexican American kids. Mm. And last year, for the first time, one of the teachers and I started a GFA, a Gay Straight Alliance. Um, and this is just enormous for those kids, particularly living in this relatively conservative Catholic Mexican community with parents who believe if they were to find out some of them that their kids would go to hell and this kind of idea. I couldn't have, I, I mean, I look at these kids with my mouth. There's only six, eight kids who come to the meeting, but mm -hmm. uh, I couldn't, could I imagine in seventh or eighth grade going to a meeting and because it's not about sexuality, these kids aren't having sex. They're, but it's about you. You can, I mean, to see kids at that age, you can see they're not just imitating something they saw on TV. Maybe partially, but you can see that people are born differently. You know, and. You know, when a girl says, but I don't want to wear those girly clothes. They're uncomfortable. And my mother keeps trying to get me. I don't want to dress like that. You know, mm -hmm. it's something genuine in her. Or when a boy says to me, oh, this kid threw our flag on the floor and it's all wrinkled. And do you have an iron, Mr. Auerbacher? You know, I don't want those wrinkles. You know, that there's something in him which likes values something beauty that another kid doesn't see or respect and um uh and that they have they they have an opportunity to be who they are and with more safety. All right, perfect. Great. Well thank you. Um that was wonderful. Anything else? you'd like to add or to um, sort of give insight to that you think we haven't covered? Well, I got married, <laughs> so I never could have imagined that. <laughs> you know, that, I mean, I never could have imagined that. And, of course, legally that only occurred five years ago. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Congratulations. But, um, I mean, I so for, I mean, just to go back to, you know, something I believe very strongly. You could say, yes, it's a great political act. I got married, and that's true. But now the hard work of the relationship of marriage and the commitment and all the overcoming the childhood fears that the other person won't consider me or that my needs won't matter, without the tools of um, you know, meditation or communication or some kind of tools, how is anybody's relationship going to function? So, yeah, it's great. People can get married legally, but then the hard work begins, right? No, absolutely. You very much so. I, I agree. I really do agree. Well, I want to thank you again for your time, Mr. Auerbacher. This was, um, but that you know that much. wasn't ta just a, that wasn't taken for granted. You say, and so I saw what the Cuban Revolution was like, and yes, yeah. they were making changes in the macro world, but how were people? You know, that revolution degenerated into you know repression because all the issues of being human were not addressed. You know, so the. You know, some real revolution on Earth has to be some combination of macro and internal. You know, for me, anyway. All right, perfect. That's my. Um, yeah. No, anything else? <laughs> anything else? Uh, no. Um, so you you know the names of some of the other GLF members, if you. Because there were. 
you can say anything you want to say. If you want to mention their names, it'd be great. Well, because there were, I believe, people who actually um, were at those initial meetings. Um, the names I can think of are Martha Shelley, Jim Forat, John O'Brien. Um, I believe, you know, they can describe what the, you know, the, the initial formation of the Gay Liberation Front within right, week, weeks of the, of the street rebellion at Stonewall. Okay, great. No, thank you. Thank you. That'd be great. Thank you. I, I, yeah, we'll, I'll record them now. Right, so you know, uh, you know how to, you know how to get in touch with them. Well, hold on. I, I just want to end the interview. I'll end the interview officially and then I'll call you back shortly. Uh, oh, but okay. I want to thank you for your time, Mr. Auerbacher, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of the day. Okay. Thank you.